So we have a 63-year-old woman with established restrictive cardiomyopathy presenting with increasing effort and tolerance and dyspnea. She has to stop and rest after walking from the kitchen to the bedroom. Uh, her medications of furosemide and metoprolol. Here's her um, uh, examination with a third heart sound and an elevated venous pressure. Which of the following is the next best step in her management? Decrease metoprolol, add low-dose lisinopril, increase furosemide, or decrease furosemide? Oh, this is a good question. This will be a high discriminator. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. So I, I think you need to listen to Dr. Amon's part about restrictive cardiomyopathy. And, and this is a, actually a very practical question, too. Okay, let's go to the next one. A 36-year-old man presents with dyspnea on exertion over six months. They're worse in warm environments and following meals. Echo reveals a left ventricular hypertrophy with a septal thickness of 24 millimeter. No systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve is noted um, on the echo. But his carotid is brisk, his lungs are clear, but he's got a 2 over 6 systolic ejection murmur from the squat to stand. What's the next best step? Cardiac MRI, echo with provocation, coronary angiography, or TEE? Okay, we'll remember that. Next one. 48-year-old man presents with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, had an AICD after having an out-of-hospital arrest. His thickness is 25 millimeter. He's got a gradient of 64 at rest, active and asymptomatic. So what would you recommend about his first-degree relatives or his relatives? All adult first-degree relatives should have an echocardiogram once after the age of 25. Echo is recommended every two years in all first-degree relatives. First-degree relatives engaged in competitive athletics should be screened annually. A normal electrocardiogram is sufficient to exclude HCM and family members. Very practical question on screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, we'll remember that. Okay, final one. 64-year-old woman, hypertension, has a new onset of dyspnea, class two symptoms. Blood pressure is normal, amlodipine 10 per day, metoprolol 25 twice a day, aspirin 325 per day. She's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a septal thickness of 22, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, moderate mitral regurgitation, and an outflow tract gradient of 50 increasing to 80 during the strain phase of the Valsalva. So what would you recommend on this 64-year-old woman with symptoms of dyspnea, discontinue amlodipine, increased metoprolol, septal myectomy, or septal ablation? Remember this, and hopefully change it. Hopefully change it. I think there's one more. Is there one more? Uh, ICD implantation is uh, considered appropriate for which of the following? Syncope during a blood draw, outflow tract gradient greater than 90, wall thickness greater than 30, gadolinium enhancement greater than 5% on cardiac MR scanning. Okay, so we'll remember this. So it's always nice to hear from the person who wrote the guidelines on the subject that he's talking about. And uh, Steve is, like I said before, nationally and internationally recognized as an expert in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy.
Even though there's um, Gersh's name as the first author, Steve was actually the one that did most of the writing of the guidelines. You can talk to him about that afterwards. <laughs> but um, you'll, you'll, I, I think you'll enjoy very much um, a very nice, concise, overall view on all of the cardiomyopathies, but specifically hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I have no disclosures for this talk or any other. Um, the learning objectives were addressed in each of those questions. We're going to talk about non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathies first, and then we're going to really delve into HCM because it really is a very testable, boards writers love it because there's pathophysiology, there's genetics, there's defibrillators, there's surgery, there's all kinds of things you can worry about. It's a great field to test. Talk about family screening uh, and all of those issues. So in terms of cardiomyopathies, um, you can break them down into several different categories. This is one that was published in circulation in 2006, and the reference is at the bottom there. Um, you're going to hear a lot about dilated cardiomyopathies uh, tomorrow on the heart failure day. Um, you heard some about stress cardiomyopathy the other day. We're going to talk about some of these here in the genetic side uh, here for a moment. I do want to do one slide about dilated, though, and that is if you're being presented with a case of dilated cardiomyopathy on the boards, and in your practice, make sure you look for the reversible causes. Don't just assume it's idiopathic. So, you know, coronary disease is obviously something we all search for, but talk about alcohol, talk about sleep apnea. Remember, hemochromatosis is a dilated cardiomyopathy, not a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, hemochromatosis, look for iron overload in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. They do want you to find those reversible causes because you can reverse them and not have to have them be on five drugs and CRT and those kind of things if you can treat the underlying cause in some cases. So what do you need to know about restrictive cardiomyopathies? You need to be able to recognize the pattern, and that is normal ventricular size, normal ventricular function, and enormous atria. If you see that, you should start to think about restrictive cardiomyopathies. The, even this atrium looks big in the peristernal long axis here. So this is a pattern you just need to recognize kind of out of the box. Normal size atria, normal size ventricles and huge atria. The classic restrictive Doppler findings are shown here. So in the mitral inflow, the E wave is very high, it's above one. The deceleration time is very short and the A wave is diminutive. Remember, the atrium has almost nothing to filling in someone who's truly restrictive because the filling pressures are too high in the atrium, you just can't push blood in there. Um, this happens to be the pulmonary vein signal. The boards are not going to ask on the general cardiology examination about pulmonary vein findings for diastolic function. They're going to show you classic restrictive physiology or delayed relaxation uh, abnormalities. But this is what the pulmonary veins would look like, very low systolic forward flow. You fill, you fill the atrium when the atrium is being emptied out the bottom into the, across the mitral valve, so you have a uh, high um, pulmonary vein diastolic velocity. It doesn't really change much with valsalva maneuver. And your tissue Doppler velocities are very low. This is about three, centimeter, three centimeters per second. We talked about this the other day. The classic cath tracing is the dip in plateau. Remember this rapid filling wave. This is your S3. This is your, X, this is your Y descent in the jugular venous pressure. It's a classic finding for restrictive cardiomyopathy. We talked about how to distinguish those things from constriction just the other day, and so review that again as you're preparing for the board examination. Restrictive cardiomyopathies come from a whole bunch of causes, too. Um, unfortunately, most of these underlying causes aren't treatable or reversible for the restrictive cardiomyopathy. It's bad to get diagnosed with RCM. Uh, certainly, maybe if you get someone who's got hyper eosinophilias, um, so an eosinophilia kind of greater than 1,500 for six months, if you can get that suppressed, or an eosinophilic leukemia or churg strauss syndrome have all been caused these findings, and I'll show you some cases here coming up. Maybe you can reverse that a little bit, but most of these things, it's, once it's there, it's there, um, and it's a bad deal. Treatment is really tough. It's cautious diuresis. These people need high left atrial pressure in order to fill their ventricle, and so if you overly diurese them, they're just going to have low cardiac output that way and feel weak and tired and dizzy. We generally favor calcium channel blockers a little bit. Beta blockers we have to use really cautiously. And the issue with beta blockers is, remember, let me just back up and show you this on the mitral inflow again. These people are only filling their ventricle here. So all of this time there isn't much filling. If you slow their heart rate down, all you're doing is 
creating more cardiac standstill. Nothing's happening in the last two-thirds of diastole. And so if you excessively slow the heart rate of someone's restrictive cardiomyopathy, all you're doing is decreasing their cardiac output because you're not enhancing filling at all. So in a patient with restrictive physiology, whether it's restrict restrictive cardiomyopathy or another cause, if you change their heart rate from 50 to 60 beats per minute, you're going to improve their cardiac output by 20% by doing that. So restrictive filling, you don't want to slow the heart rate. You want to let it creep up a little bit because th their filling is limited by this, by this very tight uh, uh, stiffness. And so let their heart rate run a little bit faster. So don't excessively beta block patients who have restrictive cardiomyopathy. ACE inhibitors and ARBs, we don't really use that so much in restrictive cardiomyopathy. So it's not heart failure isn't just heart failure. Heart failure and restrictive cardiomyopathy, all you're going to do is make these people hypotensive and dizzy. So really, I would cross this off the list of common therapies. The, the main therapy is cautious diuresis and cardiac transplantation. And you want to get them down that pathway soon because they're not going to feel better soon and they're likely going to deteriorate rel relatively rapidly. So you do want to consider the restrictive cardiomyopathy patients for transplant early. Let's go over a few other types that you should be able to recognize. The classic one that they put on boards all the time is amyloid. It's the classic restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, so if you see an echocardiogram that looks like this, concentric hypertrophy, kind of that scintillating appearance, and they might give you an EKG that has normal or low voltage, ding, 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 that should say amyloid. And the deal there is you're going to want to make sure you treat their systemic amyloid and not just go after their heart. They, they can be restricted. You can actually get outflow tract obstruction in, in amyloid patients, and sometimes we've relieved that, but you have to treat their underlying disease. So remember, a super thick wall, kind of the shiny, scintillating appearance of the myocardium, and normal or low voltage on the ECG, which would be an appropriate think amyloid. Uh, Dr. Young showed you the other night on the cardiac MRI. They also don't, when you try to do the gadolinium enhancement, you can't null the myocardium. So there's a very distinct pattern on, on gadolinium imaging on MRI that can be fairly diagnostic for cardiac amyloid as well. Hyper eosinophilic syndromes look like this. You get this deposition of major basic protein in the apex of sometimes both ventricles, but often just the left ventricle, and it kind of tracks up the endocardium can see it here, and in short axis, it's all this white material there. It's not really thrombus, but it's thrombus-like, but it has all kinds of other funky components in it, and it starts to adhere the myocardium and make it stiff, and as it grows more towards the mitral valve, it can start to impair the posterior mitral leaf of the mitral valve, and they can get mitral regurgitation as well. If there's an underlying cause, a, an eosinophilic leukemia, you treat that. If it's Churg-Strauss, you treat their Churg-Strauss aggressively. But if it's the idiopathic hyper-eosinophilic syndrome, often the drugs are prednisone and hydrea uh, to try to suppress their eosinophil counts. Other cardiomyopathies that you should be aware of, so this was discussed during the rhythm day. The diagnosis of ARVD, remember, is fatty replacement of the RV free wall. On an imaging study, it's going to be a big dilated RV, maybe some segmental outpouchings, those kind of things. But this is, um, this is what happens with ARVD. There is the repolarization abnormalities that were discussed yesterday on the ECG. 30% of them have a clear family history, and the main recommendation is defibrillator and no competitive athletics. Left ventricular non-compaction, we're learning more and more about. Uh, so this is a failure of this myocardium to pack down and create a, a clear wall. Here's another case. Um, again, both of these are autopsy specimen. Um, I don't know that they're going to test on left ventricular non-compaction because we don't really know that much about it. I think we know the tip of the iceberg about non-compaction. This is what it looks like on an echocardiogram. You see the wall looks kind of shaggy. It doesn't look like a clear, distinct uh, endocardial border. You can start to see the dip crypts, deep crypts and recesses here on this image. Many of the patients that are symptomatic will have dyspnea, but really more and more patients are asymptomatic. Our imaging techniques are so much better now, we're starting to appreciate that this is a spectrum of disease. Uh, 
And actually, genetically, there's some overlap with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and some of the dilated cardiomyopathies even. So this is really a spectrum disease that, that the old teachings about it being a bad, a bad actor may be overblown. Yes, we do see left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure in some patients. There's probably an increased risk for sudden cardiac death, but it might be amongst those that have low EF only. We just don't have enough data to be able to give you clear guidelines on this. The current recommendations, again, suggest no competitive athletics for these individuals. In terms of treating them, this is kind of the way I go about it. I first look at their systolic function. If they have normal LV function, then I do a sudden cardiac death risk assessment similar to the way I risk stratify HCM. And I'll talk about that in the talk coming up. And I treat them as if they have stage B heart failure, that is, they are predisposed to it. So they should be on one or more agents to maybe prevent progression to stage C heart failure. If they already have low EF, then I use a combination of the HCM and dilated cardiomyopathy criteria for sudden cardiac death, and I treat them based on whether they have symptoms. And yes, we probably anticoagulate if their EF is low because there is some tendency to form clots deep in the ventricles. The device-based guidelines therapy says a defibrillator is class 2B for any patient with a left ventricular non-compaction. But again, I think we can be more sophisticated about that. And if they have a family history of sudden cardiac death, non-sustained VT, a low EF, or unexplained syncope, I think that makes you more prone to want to recommend a defibrillator for these individuals. So that's the way we would approach non-compaction. So know the restrictive cardiomyopathies. Know not to overly diurese or overly beta block them. They're going to be referred for, con for transplant and recognize some of those common patterns in terms of the imaging and the associations. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is much more likely to show up on your test, however. So there's all kinds of things that can cause thick walls, and in your clinical practice, you have to think about which one of these may be present. There's lots of things. But the nice thing is most of these other things have systemic symptoms that go with them. So it's hard to have Friedrich's hypertrophy without the ataxia. Uh, Fabre's disease often has renal dysfunction and the neurologic findings that go with it. So most of these other things have something else that goes along. Lots of press, lots of attention paid to distinguishing an athlete's heart from a hypertrophic heart. It actually is sometimes difficult, but not as often as you think. First of all, it's really, really, really hard to train your heart thick. It's really hard to train your heart thick. There was a, a study done in the UK of 3,500 elite athletes, and 1% of them had LVH, and they were all 14 and 15 millimeters. So when you have 17, 18, 19, 20 millimeters of hypertrophy, particularly if it's not concentric, it's asymmetric, that's HCM. HCM hypertrophy, the cavity gets small. Athletic adaptation usually involves chamber dilatation because most athletes need a bigger stroke volume in order to sustain their the activity they're doing. And so from a qualitative standpoint, if you're looking at an echo image, take a step and look, stop looking at the numbers and say, does that heart look proportional to itself? Or do the walls look excessively thick? If the walls look thicker than the chamber, then maybe that's pathologic. If the walls look proportional to the chamber size, that's probably physiologic adaptation to the training they're doing. But these are the other things you look for, marked left atrial enlargement on HCM, bizarre ECG, and I'll show you an example. They're going to have abnormal left ventricular filling with reduced tissue Doppler velocities. Their MRI is going to be abnormal with gadolinium enhancement. Uh, their strain might be abnormal, where the athletes, they have a normal to large left ventricular and diastolic dimension. They have excellent exercise capacity, no abnormalities on the MRI. And in reality, the athlete's heart will change if you ask them to stop exercising for two to three months, and the HCM heart won't change. So that's kind of one of the steps we take. Now, HCM. HCM is a genetic predisposition to the heart muscle being too thick. Uh, it occurs in one out of 500 people. It involves some cellular abnormalities, so there's this, rather than the normal cardiac muscular architecture, these, there's abnormal whirling, the, it's disorganized. The pattern of hypertrophy can be anywhere in the ventricle, and I'll show a, a schematic of that. Each of your patients needs to learn about these facts about HCM because there's so much misinformation out there. You know, there's half a million people in the United States with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Many of them don't know they have it because they're doing so well. The average age of death is about the same of that as the general population, and most patients have minimal symptoms that we can usually control with medications. 
Yes, there is an increased rate for sudden cardiac death of about 1 percent per year, and we'll talk about that in terms of selecting patients for defibrillator later on. We'll talk about family screening. Now this is important. HCM patients can and should exercise. So when I first came out of training, people were being told not to do any exercise. And so you turn people with HCM into fat, out of shape people with HCM. And the combination isn't very good. They get short of breath, surprisingly. So people can exercise like we recommend everyone else exercises. What's recommended is that they not participate in high intensity training and competitive athletics, in part because they're more prone to subendocardial ischemia than a normal thickness heart, because the blood flow doesn't grow proportionally to the thickness. But they should be healthy. They should get physical activity uh, every day. All of, our medic all of our therapies, medications, operations are designed for symptom relief. There isn't really robust evidence, there's some circumstantial evidence that some things may change natural history, but really you think about medication changes based on the patient's symptom status. So here's an example of a patient, and there's some key physical examination findings in here. So this is a 26-year-old male with exertional dyspnea and palpitations. Usually the vital signs aren't too abnormal, they usually have JVP. Remember, you're hearing a late peaking systolic ejection murmur usually, so you want to check the carotids. If it's decreased, it's aortic stenosis, but if it's brisk, think HCM. The apex, you can often feel a palpable S4 or a bifid apical impulse, sometimes even trifid apical impulse. But remember, when you're feeling two beats with each uh, at the apex, you're feeling the S4. It also makes a nice way to auscultate and be able to listen to the S4 at the same time you're feeling it if you want to confirm that. The uh, systolic ejection murmur again is late peaking, but it ends before S2. And then the maneuvers. There's all those things in the physical examination talk about maneuvers. Practically speaking, HCM is the one where those changes are dramatic. The changes to maneuvers with MR, with AS, they change a little bit in terms of how intense they are. HCM patients may have no murmur at rest and a grade three murmur when you do squat to stand. It's a dramatic change. Um, it's a very dynamic process. Here's the classic ECG for HCM. It's more common on boards than in clinical practice, and that is these narrow, symmetric, deeply inverted T waves, particularly laterally. When you see this kind of ECG, you're really supposed to think of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is, this is most common for. Most people with HCM have uh, nonspecific ST and T wave changes and left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, but also remember that 5% of patients with clear echocardiographic HCM have an entirely normal electrocardiogram. The computer reads it as normal. So that's really normal. So 5% of patients with clear hypertrophy up into the 20s can have a normal EKG. So an EKG isn't sufficient to really rule this out in individuals. As I mentioned, you can get the hypertrophy involving just the basal septum, the whole septum. We have cases involved just in the lateral wall and anterior wall. Concentric hypertrophy is possible, and then the subtype of apical HCM. More common in Japan, but it's in about 10% of our cases here in North America. The genetics of HCM are confusing. So 14 different genes, plus or minus, have been identified as being associated with HCM. We don't really know the final common pathway for how those mutations result in hypertrophy in segments of the heart and not in other segments of the heart. Most of them involve the proteins that make up the cardiac myocyte, so actin, tropomyosin, troponin, myosins have all been identified. The big three are up here. If you have someone with Wolf Parkinson White in HCM, think about the PRKAG mutation. So that's, that's one association that you should know genetically that Wolf Parkinson White and HCM exist together in the PRKAG. But most of the time when they're talking about genetic abnormalities and they're trying to lead you down a pathway, they're going to give you the, one of these three mutations is most likely going to identify HCM. So these are the things that we'll talk about here for the remainder of my session, family screening, treatment of symptoms, and sudden cardiac death risk. Here's the summary of screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you're going to use echocardiography as your screening tool, you, we generally recommend starting to screen in adolescence or the onset of puberty or at any consideration of competitive athletics, and then we screen those people every year until they are a full-grown human who is no longer competing in athletics.
Once they are a full-grown human who is no longer competing in athletics, we screen them every five years. And the rationale for this is there's several case reports of late-onset HCM occurring in the sixth decade of life. And so we, the one-time echo in your 20s isn't sufficient to exclude HCM in an individual. You have to, it's a lifelong, if you're going to use lifelong imaging program, if that's what you're going to use. Now, we do have genetic testing that we can use to screen now. Um, so if we can identify the HCM-associated mu mutation in the patient or proband, then we can screen their first-degree relatives for that, for that mutation. The genetic testing is useful only for sc family screening at this point. It does not help us risk stratify. It does not help us understand which therapy is going to be effective. It's a family screening tool. Only 30 to 60 percent of patients that come in the front door can we identify their mutation right now because we don't know all the mutations. It has been relatively expensive in the past, although all the commercial companies now have uh, programs to reduce the out-of-pocket expenses for patients, so it's actually easier to utilize now. So if you do genetic testing and you can identify that mutation for the individual, that really is the preferred screening strategy for their family because let's say that uh, there's a 30-year-old male who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and he has a myosin heavy chain mutation. His seven-year-old daughter is negative. She doesn't have to have 12 echoes the rest of her life to screen for HCM because she isn't at risk because she doesn't have dad's mutation. So that's the preferred strategy if we have it. It's an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, so each offspring of an HCM patient has a 50% chance of inheriting this. If, we, if you don't do the genetic testing or if that testing comes back negative, then you do that echo surveillance program that I discussed. So that's family screening. Next, we're going to talk about treatment of patients with HCM, and it's treatment of symptoms. So again, general guidelines are I advise my patients to be active and healthy. They should exercise, low to moderate intensity exercise, avoid extreme activities. Uh, they also, particularly if they're obstructive, you need to in inform them to make sure they stay hydrated. That means hydrating before, during, and after they exercise, because dehydration is likely going to exacerbate their outflow tract obstruction, and we'll talk about that pathophysiology in a moment. So again, don't tell your HCM patients to go home and sit on the couch. That doesn't do them any favors. In order to understand the treatment, you have to understand why they get symptoms. So I mentioned before that the heart muscle hypertrophies, but the capillary network is not as dense in HCM as it is in a normal thickness heart, so they are more prone to subendocardial ischemia, and that's why angina can be one of their presenting symptoms. Everyone with a thick heart essentially has some diastolic dysfunction, but two-thirds of patients with HCM also have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, either at rest or with simple provocation. It's a very dynamic outflow tract obstruction. It changes every few minutes based on how warm it is, when you last ate, how much sodium you've had, how fast your heart's beating. All those things make this a very dynamic process. When the obstruction is high, you increase the pressure in the left ventricle, which makes your coronary perfusion pressure less, and again, augments your tendency to ischemia, angina, or shortness or, or dyspnea as an anginal equivalent. The mitral regurgitation associated with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve is proportional to the degree of outflow tract obstruction, so mitral regurgitation can be moderate or severe and exacerbate a, uh, shortness of breath, and I, obviously you can get presyncope or syncopal with uh, bad outflow tract obstruction. So the classic triad of angina, dyspnea, and presyncope can occur in HCM. It is different in HCM patients than your aortic stenosis patients, for instance, because it varies in HCM patients. They come in baffled because they say, there's days I can do anything I want, and there are days where I can't walk to my kitchen without being short of breath. And AS patients don't do that. Their obstruction is fixed. Their, their symptoms are predictable. So often the patients with HCM are really frustrated because they've been kind of written off by their healthcare teams before saying they're crazy. They, you know, nothing causes you to be normal one day and abnormal that way. They get treated for exercise-induced asthma or those kind of things. But variable symptoms are very common in HCM. So this is the uh, schematic of the mechanism of outflow tract obstruction. Blood has to flow around the hypertrophied septum and it actually pushes the anterior mitral leaflet into the outflow tract more than it was before. It opens it up and it shunts blood posteriorly into the left atrium. 
So this outflow tract obstruction is associated with high velocities across the out outflow tract obstruction and a posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation. If you're doing a study on a patient with HCM and the jet is anterior or central, that might imply concomitant intrinsic mitral valve disease. But if the jet is posterior, it will likely get better with correction of the outflow tract obstruction without having to do anything to the mitral valve. The mitral valve is an innocent bystander. This obstruction, as I mentioned, is dynamic. It gets worse if contractility goes up, if afterload goes down, or if preload goes down. That's exactly what happens when the patient stands up from the echo table to walk out of the office. All of your patient's gradients are higher leaving the echo lab than they are in the echo lab, just by the fact that they stood up and walked. And so that's why we have to do some provocative maneuvers if we don't demonstrate outflow tract obstruction in patients who have symptoms that sound like outflow tract symptoms. So if those things make obstruction get worse, we're going to try to avoid those things in order to decrease their tendency to outflow tract obstruction. We're going to try to not augment their contractility. We're going to try to maintain their afterload and maintain their preload. In patients that are in the hospital, you avoid giving them positive inotropes in the ICUs because it's going to make their obstruction worse. You avoid giving them high-dose diuretics, and I've put a box around vasodilators because when you have patients in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, they often have some mild concomitant hypertension, and there's a tendency to put them on pure vasodilators as a therapeutic option for their hypertension. That's going to make their outflow tract obstruction worse. So one of the most beneficial things you can do from a therapeutic standpoint is not add medications but subtract or change medications for some of these patients. I've had patients go from class three to normal removing ACE inhibitors uh, from their medications and maybe adding a beta blocker in to help them with their hypertension then. The mainstay of therapy is beta blockers, verapamil or diltiazem. Stay away from the dihydropyridine class of calcium channel blockers because they are pure vasodilators. So the nifedipines, amlodipines, those are pure vasodilators. Verapamil and diltiazem have both heart rate slowing, so you prolong diastolic filling period, and negative contractility effects that help diminish the outflow tract obstruction. Disapyramide can be added to one of these others as a next step. It's, a, it's effective in about 70% of patients. It has its own set of side effects, uh, including uh, difficulty uh, voiding for men with any BPH. Again, avoid vasodilators and make sure your patients without flow tract obstruction know to stay hydrated. The success of medical therapy in HCM is not dose related and it's not gradient related. What we're trying to do with these medications is really blunt the augmentation of the gradient with effort. The patient tells you whether, whether the medication is successful or not. If you start beta blockers on a patient and they come back and say, yeah, I feel better, I can do more. That's success, even if the gradient is slightly higher today than it was before you started the beta blocker. Because remember, this changes from day to day. It's a moving target. You can't use that as the therapeutic target. The patient integrates all that into their daily life, and they can tell you, I can do more now than I did before. That's successful medical therapy. If they don't do more now than they did before, then you aren't successful yet. We talk about increasing the dose of beta blockers to make sure it's having an effect. So if you get the heart rate down into the low 60s or high 50s, then at least you're getting beta blocker effect. If they're still running in the 80s, they probably have room in their beta blocker dose to try more. But there's no reason to do it if they're feeling good. This pie chart is to show, you know, we have a large referral practice uh, because of our success with myectomy. But even with that, I looked at 1,500 consecutive patients, and two-thirds of our patients left here without an intervention, just with adjustments of their medications. If you get them on the right medications, patients will do really well. When do we do procedures? We do procedures for patients with obstruction and symptoms that are refractory to the medications we use, or the medications add side effects that are just as intolerable as the original symptoms were. So surgical myectomy has been around for over 50 years now. It's done through an incision in the aorta, looking down through the aortic valve and resecting part of the basal septum. It's a very safe and effective operation. The operative mortality is really half a percent. Our uh, last operative death uh, for an isolated myectomy was 20 years ago. Um, 
the gradient is uh, nearly abolished, and the success rate is 90 to 95 percent. Complication rates overall are about 2 to 3 percent. It's a very effective operation when done by experienced operators. So we have 10 cardiac surgeons. Two of them do myectomies here. They each do 75 to 100 a year. If you're doing five or six a year, that's probably not enough to understand the nuances of what it takes to get this done right. We have data that shows our post-operative survival is equivalent to the general population survival. So again, early on in myectomy, there was this thought that maybe you made them feel better but shorten their lives. The reality is we actually make them more like the general population. Their survival is the same as compared to patients who have obstruction that never have that obstruction relieved who have a much lower uh, long-term survival. We also see, in, in, notably, that the rate of appropriate ICD discharge is very low in patients who have had myectomy. So it may be that that load from the obstruction is triggering arrhythmia, and when we relieve the obstruction, they get a little bit better. This isn't the reason to do an operation, but it's nice to be able to counsel patients about this, that they we're not going to see an increase in ICD discharges with myectomy. So we do have observational data that say overall after myectomy that survival is great. It's low, it's, it, the, the death rate is lower than in prior population-based studies of HCM, as are the risk for arrhythmogenic events. Now ablation is newer, although it's been around for almost 20 years itself now. The baseline indications are the same for ablation as they are for myectomy, obstruction with symptoms refractory to medications. You don't change the indications for either one. There were about 1,000 patients studied in 20 studies uh, in this decade. The gradient isn't quite as robustly relieved as it is with HCM. The New York Heart Association class for those who respond is very similar to those who respond to myectomy. The problem is about 20 to 25 percent of patients who are candidates for ablation won't respond because the coronary anatomy doesn't match up where we need it to to do the ablation adequately. One of our colleagues, Dr. Paul Sarajal, who you meet tonight, did a paper that talked about predictors of success from ablation. That's too nuanced for the boards, but young patients with high gradients and a lot of hypertrophy are less likely to respond uh, to ablation than myectomy. The complication rates are largely pacemakers because we get uh, complete heart block in uh, uh, about 10% of patients with undergoing ablation. And the mortality rate isn't better with ablation than it is with myectomy. So these, these numbers, again, are Mayo data uh, in terms of the similar complications. So overall, ablation is less invasive, shorter hospital stay, and less pain, but the outcomes for the underlying disease itself are not quite as robust as they are with the operation. This just reminds you that um, an ablation tends to bag the right ventricle, or the right bundle. So if they have a pre-existing left bundle branch block, there's a 40 to 50% chance of complete heart block with ablation. Myectomy tends to get into the left bundle. Remember, the left bundle is not a discrete cable. It's a whole bunch. It's an array. And so they come out with hemi blocks and not so much complete left bundle branch block. And that's why complete heart block is much less of an issue with myectomy than it is with ablation. But one thing when you're doing case selection, remember, if you're thinking about ablation for someone with a pre-existing left bundle, they're going to have a very high chance of needing a pacemaker following that procedure. Again, in our, in our data, patients under the age of 65 do better uh, long-term symptom-free survival than myectomy patients, uh, than ablation patients do. So myectomy is better than ablation in the younger patients. When we were writing the guidelines, and this was a long, long, tedious debate, um, these were the guidelines that we came out. If a patient is a surgical candidate, I mean, they, their operative risk is acceptable and you have an experienced surgeon, then myectomy is a class 2A indication and ablation is a class 2B, 2B. You discuss all the options with the patient, and as long as you have experienced operators, it's 2A for myectomy and 2B for ablation. If the patient is frail, is unlikely to survive a cardiac operation, et cetera, then ablation becomes a 2A. We put pacing on the figure that's in the guidelines document. I can't remember the last patient I sent for dual chamber pacing as the primary therapy. If they had a pacemaker already, I sometimes see if I can adjust the timing intervals to make a difference for them. But really, that's not a modern therapy for obstruction in HCM. So most patients with HCM symptoms can be managed with medication adjustments. For the minority that need 
septal reduction therapy, myectomy is the preferred choice, and ablation becomes an alternative for those who either have personal preferences or are so frail the operation is likely to be unsuccessful. Now, what about the sudden cardiac death issue? As I mentioned before, sudden cardiac death does occur in about 1% of HCM patients each year. That's higher than the general population, and that's why we have to go through risk stratification with them. The items in the blue boxes here are considered the primary risk factors for sudden cardiac death in HCM. It's non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, particularly in patients under the age of 30, either at rest or with exercise. Massive hypertrophy, 30 millimeters or more. Now, that's not a step function. The risk isn't low at 29 and high at 30. It's kind of linear, but that's kind of the arbitrary cutoff that we've used in the guidelines. If a person's blood pressure fails to rise when they exercise by at least 20 millimeters of mercury or drops at peak, that's a high risk finding. A family history of sudden cardiac death due to HCM in a primary relative is a, sudden, is a risk marker. And unexplained, meaning it's not vasovagal, it's, it's not an obvious cause, uh, or it sounds arrhythmogenic, that's another cause. Fibrosis on the MRI, the paper just came out recently, that probably will emerge as an independent risk factor, but it takes 20% of the ventricle to be replaced by scar for you to meet the criteria that say that's an independent risk factor. That's a lot of scar. Most patients have patchy, mild degrees of 5% or less. There was a lot of thoughts about mutations, and Dr. Ackerman and I did some studies, and really, there's no mutation that predicts sudden cardiac death. Some of the initial papers were, were people that had a lot of sudden cardiac death went to major medical centers and had their genotypes done, and then that was attributed to the genotype. But in unrelated individuals, no genotype seems to predict sudden death more than any other one. So the genetics themselves don't seem to do it. It's the family history that's more important. And as I mentioned, outflow tract obstruction is associated with sudden cardiac death, but since it's a moving target, how do you know when to assess their risk, at the peak or the nadir? So you can't really use it, and I think it, has, it plays into this blood pressure response and perhaps into the syncope issue. So these are the five things you need to consider. Dr. Espinoza walked you through this briefly yesterday. If a person's had an event, they have a class one indication for defibrillator. If they have any one of these three, a family history of sudden cardiac death in a first-degree relative, massive hypertrophy, greater than 30 millimeters, or recent, i.e. within the last six months, unexplained syncope, that's a class 2A indication for ICV. Non-sustained VT and the abnormal blood pressure response, both because they're a little bit nebulous, does a single three-beat run really mean something for someone on a 24-hour Holter, or this abnormal blood pressure response, if they have those other risk modifiers present. Other risk modifiers are things like a lot of gadolinium enhancement, or a wall thickness that's 28 or 29 millimeters, not 30 yet. Those kind of things are going to move you and make that a class 2A. In isolation, either one of those things makes it a class 2B. And if you have none of these things, defibrillators are not recommended. So remember these big three as the primary indications for defibrillators. Functionally, it kind of works like this. You reassure the patients that have no risk factors. Their risk is like 3 in 1,000 each year. If they have two or more risk factors, you're going to lean them towards defibrillator more. And if they have one, it's an individualized discussion with the patient. And Dr. Espinoza talked about patient autonomy and decision making. These are long discussions with people to help them understand their, current, their own situation and what the goals and risks of a defibrillator may be. So to summarize HCM, remember that the HCM murmur does increase with exercise, with Valsalva, and with squat to stand. And it gets louder with increased contractility, decreasing preload, and decreasing afterload. Beta blockers, rapamil or diltiazem, are the first-line therapy for symptomatic patients with HCM. And you use ICDs for patients with risk factors only, and these are the ones you really need to think about. And again, just to summarize, in terms of educating your patients, this is the take-home point. They're not alone. Their prognosis isn't that bad. They can exercise screen their family, and we'll treat you if you have symptoms. Thank you very much. Very nicely, very nicely put together. Let's go to this question here. 63-year-old woman established restrictive cardiomyopathy. More symptoms now, pretty significant symptoms. She's on those medications. She's got that examination. Which of the following is the next best step in her management? 
decrease metoprolol, add low dose lisinopril, increase furosemide, decrease furosemide. What did they vote before? Well, some, most said, yeah. Yeah, so we, we did better. So um, the right answer is decrease the metoprolol dose. So this is the patient. Uh, if you look over here, um, ex effort intolerance and, and dyspnea, but her lungs are clear. And her JVP, while up, is not markedly up. So it's not that this person is in a huge volume overload state. She's got a slow heart rate. And she's restrictive cardiomyopathy. And so this is the one where maybe she's on too much beta blocker. If you just back off a little bit, she might be able to do a lot more, feel a lot better while she's doing things. So I would definitely try backing off on a beta blocker, um, go down to 25 BID, and see if it makes a difference for her. It can be really a benefit for these patients. Okay, and she would definitely have that restrictive filling pattern uh, because she's got her third heart zone. Right, she's got, yeah, so we know she's restricted by the S3 and the rapid wide ascent in the neck veins. Okay, let's go to the next question. 36 year old man. Dyspnea on exertion, worse in warm environments and following meals, LVH, 2.4 centimeter, no SAM, but he's got a 2 over 6 systolic ejection murmur, increases from squat to stand. What's the next best step? MRI, echo with provocation, coronary angiography, or TEE? Good, excellent. I think that was 86% pre. So you got the point here, and that is she's got symptoms. You didn't see outflow tract obstruction at rest in the echo lab, so you need to do something because when they're laying down in the echo lab, they're maximizing their preload, they're supine. And so they're not gonna have as much gradient, so you need to do something. In our echo lab, we kind of have a, a sonographer-driven protocol, so if they don't get a gradient of at least 40 to 50 at rest, they'll automatically start doing Valsalva maneuvers with the patient. And if they still don't get a gradient of 40 to 50, then they call in a nurse and we give amyl nitrite. And if we still don't get a gradient of 40 to 50, then they send them to clinic and we decide what to do next. But, the, but we have this protocol for our standard introductory echo for HCM that usually we sort these out before they even hit the clinic um, to see if they have outflow tract obstruction. But if you have symptoms, and you don't see the obstruction on echo, but your physical examination suggests there's one, you need to look further with the echo with provocation. And again, reiterate that pearl about after meals, the symptoms after meals. Oh, that's a good point. So a lot of HCM patients seem to be worse after meals. It's probably splanchnic bed dilatation, so you've vasodilated them, and so they'll have a harder time leaving the restaurant than going into the restaurant. Um, and so if they talk about postprandial exacerbation, that's another clue to think about HCM patients. Okay, next one. 48-year-old man, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, received his defibrillator after an out-of-hospital arrest. His thickness is 25 millimeters. He's got a dynamic outflow tract obstruction with a peak gradient of 64 millimeter. Well, how would you advise screening his relatives? All first-degree relatives should have an echocardiogram once after age 25 every two years in all first degree relatives. First degree relatives engaged in competitive athletics should be screened and normal electrocardiogram is sufficient to exclude HCM. While they're answering, Steve, there was a question that came up about what do you mean competitive athletics? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so competitive athletics that involves intense physical exertion. Um, there's a Bethesda conference guideline that outlines different levels of exercise activities. So Things like archery and riflery, which are highly competitive, are allowed. But things like cycling, running, football, hockey, basketball are disallowed. So the idea is that things that you have to, that you go full out. And successful athletes, part of the reason why they're successful is because they push through symptoms like I'm short of breath or I'm having pain. And you don't want someone whose heart is prone to give them shortness of breath or pain or those kind of things from a pathologic cause pushing through that to try to win in the fourth quarter. So it really, it, it, it really is those really intense effort things that are, that are recommended. Um, not for the boards, but it's a whole, nother, a whole nother talk, about an hour long of the intricacies of athletics and HCM, but, but we're talking about those intense uh, 
cardiac uh, uh, loads. So running, exerting, heavy weightlifting, all those kind of things would be out. Golf would be acceptable. Uh, uh, the Bethesda, you know, it lists about 20 different sports that are acceptable. So if you look at that Bethesda Conference uh, 26, I think that's the one to look at. And here's your answers. So the answer here is 84% of you are correct. Uh, what did they say beforehand? Good. Oh, excellent. So yeah, we kind of went through this. So one-time echo is not enough. You have to kind of continue it through the fifth or sixth decade of life. Uh, you, you got the answer here. If, if you're young or competitive, you're getting screened annually. If you're not young or competitive, you're getting screened every five years. And you got the pearl about normal ECG isn't sufficient. OK, let's go to the next question. 64-year-old woman, hypertension, uh, class 2 symptoms, there's a blood pressure, heart rate is 64. She's on amlodipine, metoprolol, and aspirin. Echo reveals hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a gradient of 50, increasing to 80. What would you do? Discontinue amlodipine, increase metoprolol, septal myectomy, septal ablation. Okay, that's correct. So you want to get rid of that vasodilator as the next step in your therapy. Um, you may end up increasing the metoprolol, um, but the first thing you're going to do is optimize your medical plan before you move to before you move to myectomy. So get rid of the vasodilator. And another question is, how do you titrate your beta blockers in these patients? Yeah. So I mean, I you know you you start at a common starting dose and then you titrate up and I mentioned that if the heart rate's still 70 or 80, you're probably not getting the maximal beta blocker dose. So if you drive their heart rate down, their resting heart rate to just at or below 60, then you know you're getting good beta blocker effect, sometimes as low as 50, as long as they're not having other symptoms from the beta blocker. Now I would say though, if you start them on 25 metoprolol and their heart rate's still 68 but their symptoms have gone away, you don't have to intensify the dose. There's no, no need to cause them to have side effects. So go with the minimally effective dose, but you don't stop until you've tried to really push their heart rate down and maximize that beta blocker effect. And there are huge dosages of beta blockers. Oh, yeah. I, you know, we have some patients on 400 of metoprolol. So, yeah, much um, higher. So um, you have lots of room in some patients. OK, next, last question. ICD implantation, syncope, outflow tract gradient greater than 90, wall thickness greater than 30, gadolinium enhancement greater than 5%. Excellent. 